Hello everybody and welcome back to a lecture series. I'm Ted, your host, and for this lecture we are going to uh, continue right along with our discussion on the mid-19th century civil rights movement. Uh, now before we begin our lecture proper today, I would simply like to go back and just touch bases on what we discussed in our last lecture. So in our last lecture we looked at the uh, the early life and career of Thurgood Marshall. Uh, we uh, discussed the, the family history of Marshall, the uh, escape of his grandfather, Thorny Good, uh, from slavery in rural Virginia, and uh, his um, uh, founding of uh, a grocery store and his um, entrance, uh, and the Marshall family's entrance into the growing uh, African American middle class in Baltimore. Uh, we examined um, a number of Marshall's more prominent early cases. Uh, the cases of um, Hyman Sweat, George McLaren, and Ada Sippowell, uh, cases that challenged um, segregated education in graduate schools, graduate schools, graduate courses in uh, border states, states such as Texas and Oklahoma. And uh, we also looked at um, Marshall's uh, success record. He was a highly successful civil rights attorney. Um, and he earned the, uh, the title and distinction of Mr. Civil Rights, uh, something that he, uh, that he most, um, that, that he most uh, deservingly acquired. Um, from there, I'd like to dive right into uh, the real meat and potatoes of our lectures. Um, uh, and let me just begin by saying, by, by beginning this introduction by saying that the end of the Civil War, uh, end of, not the Civil War, sorry about that, the end of World War II, um, much like the end of the, of the United States Civil War, ushered in a progressive, reformative era in the Republic. Uh, both wars hinged or were fought for freedom and human rights. The experiences of the soldiers and the people on the home fronts helped to break down institutional barriers and forced Americans uh, afterward to ask themselves tough questions regarding race relations. Uh, the war the wartime demand for agricultural goods, industrial manpower, soldiers, and sailors created an unprecedented prosperity um, for the Republic, and, and that prosperity touched the African American community in a uh, really profound way. Uh, the confidence created by the wartime experiences fused with the ideals uh, for which the wars were fought created um, the perfect um, nesting conditions for the greatest social movement of the 20th century, the civil rights movement between 1946 and 1968, the mid-19th, the mid-20th century uh, civil rights movement. And now, um, I, I've, I've made a number of references to, uh, to this civil rights movement at the civil rights movement of the mid-20th uh, century. And for most people, they're, they're only ever really taught uh, one civil rights movement, this civil rights movement, and it comes as a, uh, a shock to, um, to hear it described in, um, in different terms. Um, and let me just go back uh, to sort of um, lay the, uh, the background for, for why I use that terminology. Um, uh, there have been a number of civil rights movements throughout the history of the Republic, extended all, uh, extending all the way back to colonial times. Um, the, the perception is that uh, the slave codes were accepted with no fuss. The, uh, the perception is that slavery was accepted with no fuss. And there were, from the very beginning, anti-colonial, anti-slavery sentiments, not just by the enslaved or the freed, or the freed population, but also by European Americans who recognized that this, uh, this sort of racial caste system was wrong. Um, throughout the, uh, throughout the, um, Throughout the uh, the history of uh, of the resistance to this sort of racial caste system, um, there have been a number of prominent uh, individuals, but but it's really uh, difficult to determine the exact starting date. With various proponents arguing for starting dates ranging from uh, the end of Reconstruction had to be at uh, the beginning of the Civil Rights Movement, um, the beginning of the Abolition Movement. Um, uh, during the Republic, the beginning of the, the hard faith abolition movement in the 1820s, or the uh, the, uh, the abolition movement at the end of the Revolutionary War, um, and uh, and of course, those resistance to the early slave codes in Virginia. 
Um, some people uh, some people state that uh, we can tentatively begin to date uh, civil rights um, back to 1620 in colonial Virginia. Some people say that we can look at it in, uh, in the 1690s when the slave codes were really hardened and uh, laws against miscegenation were first put in place in Virginia. Hard, stringent laws against uh, miscegenation were put in place in Virginia. Um, but, uh, but the foreground for the civil rights movement in the mid uh, 20th century began in the, in the mid 1930s with the rise of community awareness and involvement in the uh, Scottsboro uh, Boys trial that we looked at earlier. Um, you can also look at, uh, at, at institutions such as the um, uh, Southern Tenant Farmers Union, um, which was radically, which was radical for the time because it, it admitted both European and African Americans into this uh, into this union at a time when segregation was um, the well-established legal pack practice in the southeastern states. Um, and you can also look at the uh, the creation of the Fair Employment Practices Committee um, has uh, has sort of a. Um, uh, um, one of the other uh, nexus is sort of sparks that that sort of um, ignited mass community awareness for resistance against Jim Crow segregation to, to sort of harden that resolve. Um, but the catalyst, uh, the catalyst, however, was baseball. Um, uh, baseball really sort of sparked this um, the, the modern civil rights movement, as we shall see. Um, and it's really because baseball rose in popularity and began to um, really ascend to the unrivaled premier sport in the Republic. Now, baseball in the 1940s was the most exciting and attractive sport in the United States. It originated in the northeastern states and spread throughout army camps during the United States Civil War. The rapid expansion of, of uh, baseball um, what was eye catching for a number of reasons, one of which was that it was played integrated at first. Had the uh, Republic embraced Jim Crow, a rigid separation between players, teams, and leagues were established. Now, this separation led to the creation of two national leagues. The current Major League Baseball, uh, comprised of the National and American Leagues, um, which, which were uh, segregated and only allowed European Americans to play in, and the Negro League, uh, the Negro or the Colored League. Uh, the first organized league for African American players was the Southern League of Colored Baseballists. And uh, yeah, baseball players were first called Baseballists, um, which failed. Uh, that, that, that league failed had to several others while uh, while uh, while others uh, slowly coalesced into um, into uh, forming the Negro National League and the Eastern Color League, which formed uh, in the early 1920s. Now these leagues featured teams that were capable of going toe to toe with the best uh, Major League Baseball teams of the day. They also fielded many stars, such as uh, outfielder James Cool Papa Bell, uh, pitcher Leroy Satchel Page, and Josh Gibson, one of uh, baseball's most prolific hitters, with a lifetime average of 362. Uh, and just to sort of give you a, a sort of rundown of the stars of the Negro National League, um, uh, figures such as um, Andrew Rube Foster, who had a 24-year career as a pitcher and team executive for the Cuban X Giants and the Leland Giants. Uh, during the course of his career, Foster defeated uh, Philadelphia A's Hall of Famer Rube Waddell and thus earned the nickname Rube. On the other side of the base, on, on the other side of the ball. Foster has an executive uh, is credited and he's known as the founder of the Negro National League. Uh, James Cool Papa Bell, uh, during his 24-year career, um, has a uh, has an outfielder uh, for uh, for the uh, St. Louis Stars, the Chicago Americans, the Kansas City Monarchs, and the Pittsburgh Crawfords. Um, he uh, he earned a lifetime uh, batting average of 330. Um, uh, at, at lifetime average at bat. 
Uh, Jock Gibson is another. Uh, during his 17-year career, had the catcher uh, for the Pittsburgh Crawfords uh, and the Homestead Grays, along with stints in Mexico and Puerto Rico. Um, he, he became uh, uh, he, he really regarded as the most prolific hitter ever for uh, for the Negro Leagues, with over 800 career home runs and hitting averages, uh, just, just spectacular hitting averages. Uh, in 1938, his average was uh, 440. And in 1943, his average was 521, um, which, which is just phenomenal, phenomenal numbers. Um, uh, Satchel Page is another. Uh, during his 25 career, had the pitcher uh, for many teams um, during his long, long career. Um, and, and really, Satchel Page is probably most remembered uh, by fans of Major League Baseball for his astonishing comeback at the age of 59 for the Kansas City Athletics. Um, uh, coming back at, uh, and really, um, the early stages of, uh, of old age is a, is a phenomenal, uh, is a, is a phenomenal uh, feat for, for any athlete, but for, uh, for, for Satchel Paige, uh, it's one of, uh, it's one of the, uh, the testaments of his playing abilities and the uh, abilities of, uh, that, that others saw in him. Now, uh, the main figure with, uh, with baseball and civil rights is, of course, Jackie Robinson. Uh, Jackie Robinson broke the colored line of professional sports um, when he began playing uh, in the Negro Leagues after World War II. Uh, Robinson was born in rural Virginia, uh, uh, sorry, rural Georgia, to a sharecropping family. He grew up in Pasadena, California, attended the University of, uh, Southern, uh, University of California, Los Angeles, UCLA, and worked for the National Youth Administration as an athletic director before being drafted in 1942. Um, Robinson was drafted into the Army and court-martialed. Um, we spoke about this earlier. Uh, he was court-martialed for refusing to sit at the back of the bus at Fort Hood. Uh, Robinson played one season in the Negro Leagues before his skills caught the attention of the general manager of the Brooklyn Dodgers, um, Branch Rickey. Now, Ricky was astounded by Robinson's uh, spellbinding, hitting talent, and infield play. Robinson's fortitude and character would go a long way uh, to help challenge and change the prevailing attitude of team owners and players and fans of Major League Baseball. Now, at the time, there was an unwritten gentleman's agreement to keep sports segregated. Uh, Ricky like many others, recognized that the Negro Leagues were full of talented players. Uh, he also knew that the time was ripe to break the colored line. In 1945, Ricky, uh, Ricky attended a secret meeting hosted by the owners of the teams where he pitched uh, his plan to sign Jackie Robinson to the Brooklyn Dodgers. Um, his pitch was unanimously rejected by the owners at that meeting, but Ricky was undeterred and he decided to hire Robinson to a Brooklyn Dodgers development team, the Montreal Royals in 1946. Now, Robinson played phenomenally with a 349 batting average and 112 home runs. Uh, this play hardened Ricky's resolve to bring Robinson to the major leagues um, and to really just um, bridge all obstacles. Now, Ricky's great experiment began in 1947 to jeers and demonstration from baseball fans and a few baseball players. Uh, Robinson, however, was, um, was unmoved, and he played exceptionally, winning Rookie of the Year honors that season and most valuable player of, uh, of, of the National League. With Robinson's success, the gate was opened for uh, the talent in the Negro uh, National League with players such as Willie Mays, um, the best all-around baseball, who, um, who's regarded as one of the best players in all of history, and uh, the best all-around baseball player in history, Hank Aaron, um, the longtime home run champion, and of course, Ernie Banks, who won multiple honors during his career. Now, Robinson Impact had the pioneer in American athletic history goes beyond um, uh, baseball. Uh, Robinson breaking the color line uh, had a great and profound effect on allowing African Americans and Americans of other ethnicities, uh, Asian Americans, uh, Hispanic Americans, Native Americans, and so forth. It, uh, it broke all those barriers, allowing them to enter um, 
not, not just uh, baseball, but the National Football League and, of course, the National Basketball Association. Now, now we, we, uh, we were shifting from uh, athletics to the armed forces. Now, the integration of the Republic's armed forces represents one of the earliest and most successful attempts to bridge a major national institution. Uh, through two world wars, a number of gains were made by African American service members. Though by the end of World War II, the Republic's armed forces remained segregated, with the leading generals and admirals intent on keeping units segregated. Um, and many units themselves wanted to remain segregated. Uh, units such as the Buffalo Soldiers, there were many in the Buffalo Soldiers who were resolved to keep that unit and that unit's history african-american it had become the uh the the home light uh the, the shining grace of african-american this was a spot where you knew you would uh be uh surrounded by by your brethren by 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 true friends no matter what the army uh as a whole um did to you or how they treated you you were comforted in the fact that you would be surrounded by um, by, by friends. You would have NCO, um, African American non commissioned officers who would do their utmost to, um, to ensure that you were in the uh, as, as best protected uh, space as possible. There was also during uh, World War II, um, as we discussed, um, a rise in the amount of commissioned officers. So, in many of these uh, Buffalo Soldier units, you had at least African American captains. You had a lot of lieutenants, you had some lieutenants and uh, some captains running around. Uh, so that was another thing, I, that was another fear that um, if these units became integrated then they would not put African Americans in, uh, in uh, leadership positions as commissioned officers. They would be shuffled off to the side somewhere and African American um, non-commissioned officers would sort of disappear as well. This was their, um, their, their sphere, their world to grow and to evolve um, and, and to have worthwhile careers. Um, and of course, on the other side, it was just uh, great apprehension to uh, to racial mix into to any sort of um, uh, integration at all, to any sort of challenge to segregation. Um, now, uh, many thought, uh, and this was a prominent argument that that are used today, whenever um, integrating or or changing uh, doctrine with the military is concerned. Many thought that by integrating the armed forces. Um, the uh, the leaders, uh, political leaders and military leaders would, would cause the collapse of unit cohesion have resentment would undermine military readiness which was a pressing concern uh, in the early stages of the Cold War. Now, national organizations fighting for civil rights like the NAACP kept pressure on the Truman administration to push for integration and the tactic work, worked. Um, as President Truman issued an executive order in 1948 flexing his muscles as Commander-in-Chief of the United States to order all armed forces integrated and establish a committee to ensure equal treatment and opportunity in the armed forces. Now resistance to immigration, uh, to integration, so I'm sorry, was fierce. Uh, at first, the onset of the Korean War sped up the pace of integration. Um, by the war's end, the armed forces were mostly integrated, and surprisingly, the most progress had been made within the Naval Marine Corps, which had the reputation at the time of being the most racially hostile environment within the United States Armed Forces. And we will break here, and we will continue our discussion on the mid-19th century civil rights movement. As always, hit like, subscribe, and comment, and let me know uh, what you thought about this lecture. Um, and as always, I'm Ted, and I'll see you guys next time.